hello. My name is Greg J. Smith. I'm a Canadian writer and cultural worker with Holo. Uh, today, I'm joined by American curator and Web3 aficionado uh, Wade Wallerstein, who I'll introduce in a second. Uh, this is the first episode of the 2024 edition of Alt History, an online speaker series we began last year. Uh, in the series, we turn to folks on the bleeding edge of art and technology to help us understand lost and forgotten moments in digital culture. So uh, for those of you that haven't seen the series before, what do I mean when I say alt history? Um, just this general idea that new technologies and cultural developments are often synonymous with erasure, forgetting why or how we used to do things, what words or communities meant. Addressing moments, practices, and labor that have faded from memory or been outright forgotten over the last three decades um, our goal is simply uh, to not only wax nostalgic about the past, but critically engage this erasure of forgetting and use it to make sense of the increasingly weird and complicated present. So this series is brought to you by Generation, uh, a Braga Portugal-based space for creation, performance, and exhibition within the domain of contemporary music, uh, as well as the relationship between art and technology, and my team at Holo, uh, where uh, we are an editorial and curatorial platform founded in 2012, uh, we kind of fixate on emerging trajectories in art, science, technology, and culture, and these interests manifest themselves in a few ways. Um, in periodicals, I always have this handy. Um, we've published three beefy digital art periodicals or anthologies over the last decade uh, online at holo.mg, where we track interdisciplinary practices in an evolving timeline, and through collaborations with culture producers, um, exactly like you're watching today. So many thanks to Generation for the uh, ongoing support and vote of confidence and the great opportunity to host this series. So I'm thrilled to be joined by Wade, uh, who I consider a friend. Um, he's gonna be talking about the importance of second life for the digital arts, um, a moment that most certainly anticipated our current metaverse or now in our new vernacular spatial computing moment a bit. So Wade is an anthropologist from San Francisco Bay Area. His research centers on communication and virtual spaces and the relationship between digital visual culture and contemporary art. Uh, Wade is associate curator at Gray Area, founder and director of Silicon Valley, uh, the great named virtual parking lot for expanded internet art, and co-director of Transfer Gallery, uh, an exhibition space devoted to simulation and other computational art forms. He also serves as community manager for Outland Art, a Web3 art platform. So uh, Wade, without any more of my bluster, please take it away. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. I appreciate that a lot. Um, hi, everybody. Like Greg said, my name is Wade. My background is in anthropology, um, and I specialize in simulation-based artwork. Um, and today, I'm here to talk to you about art in virtual worlds, and one virtual world in particular, uh, Second Life. Why Second Life, and what could possibly have happened there that's more interesting than performance in the real world? Well, that's exactly what I'm going to get into. But before I do, I just want to say that I'm using Second Life as a case study here, an example. There are so many virtual worlds out there, and artists have always been in all of them trying to grapple with the live impact of life online. So Second Life is a massively multiplayer online multimedia platform, as they describe themselves. As a user, you can create and customize an avatar for yourself and then interact with other players inside of this enormous multi-user virtual world online. Second Life was originally released in 2003 and featured an immersive 3D graphical experience. It was somewhat unique at the time because there was no objective, no goal, uh, no quests, no manufactured storylines or conflicts. The only goal, so to speak, was to live your best life. Um, the tagline of the company uh, at launch and still to this day is your world, your imagination. The world is created. The world is created entirely by users, and through its early user interface, users could create three D objects, augment the world's landscape, and customize their avatars to the extent of their wildest imagination. Granted that the world's game engine could support it. Users can use fiat or IRL money to purchase Linden dollars, the world's in-game currency. And with Linden dollars, you can buy virtual land or islands on the grid as the home world of Second Life is referred to. You can also buy custom outfits for your avatar, home furnishings, and so much more, all created by other users. All kinds of worlds emerged from beautiful natural environments for chill hangouts to bustling urban metropolises buzzing with activity. Anything you could imagine in the physical world existed or still exists in Second Life. 
Over time, it became a haven for many users who are disabled or otherwise disenfranchised in their physical environments. And I remember very clearly one ethnographic account I read was about a Jewish man who was bedridden. It was much easier for him to attend Shabbat candle lighting services in Second Life than to light candles at home, let alone leave the house to attend a temple service. Um, and all of this to just demonstrate the the vast spread and reach of an impact of this on so many different kinds of people over the years. Um, and of course, like with any new technology or territory to explore, artists found Second Life. Um, but before I dive into the history of some of the pioneers who charted new territory through their experiments in this metaverse, I just wanted to share one of my favorite landscapes. Uh, I hope that these images have given you some sort of sense of what it can feel like to be there in Second Life. My favorite artist from the early Second Life era is Gazira Babeli, um, and Gazira first res to life in 2006. She was an avatar artist who operated solely through her presence in Second Life. No one knew the actor who was pulling the strings offline. Immediately, Gazira began to cause a ruckus in Second Life through poignant, a critical public acts. In 2006, Gazira crashed Ars Virtua, which was the virtual edition of Ars Electronica, with a work titled Singing Pizzas. In it, the artist finagled the Second Life object script to send flying singing pizzas hurtling towards virtual visitors to the fair relentlessly. You can kind of get a little bit of a visual here of some of the chaos uh, that unfolded. At the time, things like this were pretty radical, and that's because there wasn't a lot of precedence for users to experience the kind of platform or world manipulation that Gazira was experimenting with. In another performance uh, called Come to Heaven, Gazira wrote a script that launched unsuspecting passersby millions of virtual meters into the air before dropping them at a speed of 900 kilometers per hour. The result would basically fry the user's video card, not to mention stretching the physical limits of Second Life's uh, physics engine to the absolute brink. And the result were these glitched out shattering of polygon shapes in an effect that seemed to blow the user's avatar to smithereens. Uh, Gazira called these graphics card paintings and they could be experienced live. Um, these are just some still images or graphics card paintings that were produced from Gazira's own avatar being blown to smithereens in this way. Her magnum opus is a 23 minute film titled Gaz of the Desert, featuring entirely custom virtual set design. And it was inspired by Louis Buñuel's 1965 film, 1965 film, Simón del Desierto. Many of her works and performances made direct reference to art history across the ages, continuing to point to the new ways that human experience was evolving in virtual space. Often in her gallery shows, like in the image you see on screen now, Gazira would, would recreate the impossible environments inside of her films that placed visitors in this immersive, hybrid, but entirely virtual environment. Um, in this uh, still, you can see uh, IRL, or not IRL, in this, in this image, you can see set design from Gaz of the Desert, while you can also see some of uh, her performative works in the back, um, notably referencing Andy Warhol's famous Campbell's Soup Cans. Gazira was part of a was a member of a popular virtual performance troupe called Second Front, which, like Gazira, did all kinds uh, got up to all kinds of shenanigans um, in Second Life. The group staged many interventions, exhibitions, and performances in their heyday, and included artists and media theorists like Scott Kildall, Patrick Lichty, and Liz Solo. In their now iconic performance, Grand Theft Avatar, which is pictured here on screen, um, the, group lob the group robbed the Linden Lab Treasury, posing as virtual panel members at a public event. In the group's words, we grabbed the loot and freed it. <laughs> This all took place between 2006 and 2011, um, but in the next era of Second Life came a new avatar artist. Her name was Turbo Avadon, and like Gazira Babeli, uh, nobody knew who the offline referent for this avatar artist was. Um, and since resing to life in 2012 in Second Life, Laturbo has since gone on to render herself in countless other video game environments, as well as producing her own image virtually using Unreal Engine. Um, on screen here, uh, you can see Laturbo's first ever profile picture on the left, which is taken in Second Life. And on the right, you can see a much more recent rendering from just the past couple of years. 
Her first major work was called New Sculpt, and it, it, it was a series of flat files uh, or abstract geometric shapes that were produced in Second Life using Second Life's 3D sculpting tool. The work was originally presented at Transfer Gallery's physical space in Brooklyn as prints um, and as video works on screen, um, while it was also presented as 3D sculptures in Second Life in an exact replica of Transfer that Turbo created for the virtual world. This work continues to live on as an archive of still images on Tumblr, which was popular during the era that Laturbo originally made these sculptures. You can check them out at newsculpt.tumblr.com. And recently, Laturbo has actually been working with Transfer Gallery to restage and remaster the show. And today, you can still go and visit this new uh, restaging of this work um, on Laturbo's Second Life Island. That brings me uh, to uh, the kind of current day. Um, and I want to talk about an artist that I'm actually working closely with. Um, her name is Skawanadi, and she's a Mohawk Ganawage woman uh, living near Montreal. And th here on screen is a photo of the artist herself alongside her avatar XOX. All of Skawanadi's work is machinima or film created by filming inside of a virtual environment. And with her team, Skawanadi creates avatars and outfits, custom sets and environments, and then film scenes with real actors using avatars in those virtual environments that she created. In all of her work, Skawanadi aims to depict indigenous people, her people in the future. Uh, this still that you see here comes from She Falls for Ages, a film which retells the Mohawk Genesis story in a futuristic and cyberpunk setting. For Skawanadi, Second Life felt like a vehicle by which she could depict her community in whatever way she wanted. As the tagline uh, said, your world, your Im imagination, she could create her own world from her imagination. Um, and with the Initiative for Indig Indigenous Futures, Skawanadi founded Abtec, or Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace. And Abtec is this aboriginally determined research creation network whose goal is to ensure Indigenous presence in web pages, video games, and virtual worlds that comprise cyberspace. It's also an island in Second Life, which is maintained to this day. Certain days of the week are open to non-Indigenous visitors, and you can head to their website to learn more about the ongoing events, art exhibits, and performances that happen there. And I think that all of this work is really important because what was once, once fringe is clearly now the norm. Younger generations are native to virtual worlds and games like Fortnite today have billion dollar virtual trading, virtual asset trading economies. We've also seen the meteoric success of other user generated virtual platforms like Roblox and Minecraft. In 2021, Second Life's 20 in 2023, Second Life's 20th birthday, the company behind it, Linden Lab, estimated that Second Life had a GDP of $650 million. And while the metaverse as it is currently being advertised to us might still be a ways away, hey, it might like not even ever arrive, um, virtual worlds are clearly not going anywhere. They are abundant uh, and rich life worlds where artistic creation and critical rigor can be found in droves. And looking back on this history makes me extremely excited for what new generations and new worlds built in powerful contemporary game engines like Unreal might unlock for artistic potential. Thank you so much. Appreciate it a lot. Is that a conga line? <laughs> Not quite. It is. <laughs> I love it. It is. This is the only conga um, line. <laughs> so I, the first first question I think I immediately want to ask kind of drills into your past a little bit. Um, is kind of kind of just thinking about this idea that you were probably a freshly minted teenager or so when Second Life peaked in two thousand and seven. I know you're a gamer, um, so you're kind of coming to this a little bit after the fact to some degree second life i'm just wondering so like how, how when did it show up on your radar and how when did it kind of become what it seems to be a bit of a lightning rod in your kind of curatorial and digital art practice absolutely um you're right it was a little bit before my time um and as a result i was never an active user or a participant there i've always been a voyeur studying the history um and visiting you know after the fact i've now been to second life many times um but certainly not live during any of the performances or events that i that i just talked about um the this work really got onto my radar um during 
uh, my gra during graduate school when I was studying anthropology and I was reading ethnographies of virtual worlds, specifically Tom Belsdorf's Coming of Age and Second Life. It's an incredible book that ethnographically, you know, traces all of his field work in Second Life. It really gives an amazing overview of the importance of platforms like Second Life. And again, this is why I said at the beginning of my talk, why this was like an example or a case study, because what we see in Second Life is just a perfect example for what's happening everywhere in virtual online worlds, all over cyberspace. Um, and so it was during this time reading his ethnographic work. And then I started to read more ethnographic work of, of, of different researchers spending time in Second Life before I discovered Gazira Babeli, um, whose performance work really inspired me and, you know, continues to define how I think about artists working online. So was this through your anthropology study specifically that you came to it? And I guess I'm guessing I'm, I should know this, but did your, your did your studies in anthropology specifically focus on, on digital spaces? Yes, my studies oh, okay, did okay. specifically in digital yeah. spaces, but, you know, I actually, you know, had, I remember as, you know, that wasn't my first encounter with Second Life. I think that like, yeah. you know, probably at the ages of, you know, 13, 14, I definitely tried to get on, on like my parents' home, home PC um, to little avail. Um, <laughs> um, and so I certainly, you know, was aware of the platform and was watching it. I remember there was also a really famous episode um, of The Office um, where Dwight Schrute is kind of flying around um, a Dunder Mifflin headquarters as an avatar version um, of himself. Um, so I certainly was, you know, very privy. I knew about Second Life and was privy to it through advertisements, through, social, through you know, early social media and blogs, um, as well as as, you know, mass media like TV. Yeah, it's funny. It actually kind of just just you bringing up its appearance in the office. It actually kind of I mean, I think we'll probably talk about in-game economies now and I don't want to go down the crypto rabbit hole. But just from my retrospect, that the, the thinking about it through the rearview mirror, it felt very something like crypto where there was a wall of hype and then everybody kind of danced on its grave and it was the butt of jokes for a long time. Um, you know, that similar hype cycle and then kind of uh, renewal or, you know, ongoing ongoing development within it um okay well he, here's something the ars electronica pizza attack which i i vaguely remember myself um but that you know totally brought uh, a smile to my face face kind of hearing about that again um but i think it's a perfect example of um what we might call kind of tensions between diy or off off institution virtual art spaces and actual institutions so could you maybe talk, because this is something that's kind of been an ongoing thing. And I know like artists have done like guerrilla AR installations or like the MoMA. And like, this is like an ongoing tension between the the DIY virtual and the, the actual white cube or, you know, ivory tower or institution or whatever. So could you talk a little bit about the kind of what you think about these tensions um, that exist between these two poles? It's a big question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm just I'm just letting my my neurons fire away. Yeah. Um I think that you know, the tension that I see appears in terms of access and lack of access and agency and authority. Like when we're thinking about the relationship between a viewer and a monolithic institution like a museum, um the average viewer has very little agency to interact with or augment or get their have their voice heard in terms of what will you know uh, how that museum will depict the culture that they care about right um it's a very small group of people who end up ultimately making those decisions um and i think that we see the public's relationship and frustration with that in things like the recent sit in Palestine protest at the Museum of Modern Art. You know, people get frustrated, you know, with these institutions that, you know, aren't representing their ideals or their values um, in a in an in a vocal way and try to do things to to change it. Um, and I think that worlds like Second Life really opened a lot of pathways for people who felt disenfranchised. Um, that's one of the reasons why Scalinati was drawn to it, because she couldn't do what she wanted to do <clears throat> in the IRL world. She would love to be able to create physical sets and design physical costumes and do all of these things um, in the physical world, 
But she knows that not only will that be prohibitively expensive, physically potentially impossible, and also pretty difficult to distribute, um, she understands that using Second Life, she can do all of those things and potentially even reach a wider audience, not only of folks who might be on Second Life and who might, you know, come to um, Abtec Island um, to hang out and interact with the work directly, but also through other media channels, because like any virtual cyberspace, things get cut and ripped from one virtual world world and blasted around at many others. Um, and so I think that um, virtual, you know, and staging an interview, and I think that, you know, the opportunity of a virtual world that potentially many users didn't actually understand the inner workings or mechanics of an artist, a net artist who really understood how the platform operated, all of the back end inner workings, they could manipulate it, they could change it, they could actually have an impact on things that were going on that, you know, normally would be outside of their control. Um, you can do a lot more, you know, messing with the scripts of Second Life to augment somebody's experience in Second Life than you can, you know, kind of staging something gorilla in person uh, in a physical building, particularly particularly when you've got security guards and docents and, yeah. you know, all of those sorts of things. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the virtual kind of came in at this time as a radical way to push against some of the limitations that, you know, artists and creators had been feeling for decades, if not centuries. Right. So it manifested itself there because it was the right platform at the right time. And you mentioned uh, Unreal Engine. What, what, if you were to make like a lineage of, of engines or or virtual spaces or MMOs, um, what other spaces after Second Life would you cite as that have become you think fruitful or interesting playgrounds for artists? Oh, absolutely. Um, there, you can't talk about virtual worlds without talking about World of Warcraft. I think that you know that kind of emerged at a similar era, but I think that was had definitely in, enjoyed more users than Second Life did. Um, it also, you know, I think has had a little bit of a longer lifespan and Blizzard Entertainment behind Second Life has produced a number of other massively multiplayer online games um, that have, you know, enjoyed very uh, widespread popularity. Um, games like RuneScape, which was free and available in browser, also really did a lot. But again, similar era to Second Life in terms of its popularity. Um, you know, I also look towards virtual worlds that were geared towards younger audiences, like Toontown Online, um, which is something that I played as a kid, um, or things like Club Penguin, Neopets, um, these kind of, um, I think that we kind of saw at the same time as Second Life, people were realizing that uh, game engines, the computers at the time had trouble running powerful game engines. Nobody wanted to download something and install something to their computer. This is also in the era when computer viruses were a lot more common. Common and we didn't have software to protect against them that was as robust as the software that we have today. Um, and so people loved an in-browser experience, something that could just load up immediately. And interestingly, that's something that we've kind of returned to today as game engines have become so powerful that like the average computer can't run them. We're using streaming um, in browser, we're using streaming, we're using in-browser experiences and we're using um, in-browser rendering to do things that, you know, were would have been really hard in the era of Second Life. Um, some other virtual worlds that I can mention that I think um, have had a really profound impact, um, particularly after Second Life, are of course uh, Minecraft um, is you know has an unbelievable impact, particularly on younger generations. Roblox as well, and Roblox I think is really profound because it's marketed towards kids, and the primary user base is kids, like under the age of sixteen, um, and. What's interesting about Roblox is that Roblox also provides a full education and user creation platform. So on Roblox, there is no central world. There is no like main res space where everybody kind of loads into. It's a web page where there's a plethora of virtual worlds. You click whichever one you want, whichever game, whichever experience, whichever environment, which has been user created, you know, you'd like to check out um, and you go there. Um, with whoever else is also there on any particular day. Um, and the emphasis has always been on users creating these experiences and building them. And Roblox, interestingly, has, you know, taught an entire younger generation how to code, how to make games, which I think, you know, which you can argue about the, you know, corporate 
infiltration of second life into kids consciousnesses you can talk about uh robux the in-world currency and ways that roblox maybe is extracting from younger users but at the end of the day i'm really inspired by it because i think that roblox has really done an incredible job of teaching a young generation how they can build their own world in a way that you know kids didn't really do with a platform like second life second life was really for people 16 and older and they had special um they had special licenses for 13 to 15 year olds if they had like a school sponsor so yeah. it's always been an old it's always been like an uh, an older adolescent and an, and an adult platform um, and so what I'm seeing post Second Life is this urge to bring that more to younger generations, to people who have more free time or who are more native to these kinds of worlds and, and um, environments. Um, a couple others that we could talk about just really briefly that have been, I know, really impactful are uh, places like Black Desert Online. Um, uh, Guild Wars was another one that was really popular kind of in the in-between like 2010 to 2014 era. Um, and today we're seeing a lot of movement and traction in uh, battle royale style um, competitive games that are less about creation and more about um, uh you know, conducting certain acts. And that's why I think that you, uh, Second Life in a lot of ways remains unique to me to this day because most of the massively multi-user experiences that exist today do have goals and objectives and quests. There are very few places that are purely about just being there, just hanging out, just doing and creating whatever you might want. There are very, very few gamified mechanics um, in Second Life. Um, and I think that's really interesting because, you know, as you mentioned, crypto and DeFi and kind of the um, financialization of different in-game economies, um, to have a place that has an in-game econ in in economy without a sort of gamified mechanism to drive that um, is, is really, uh, I think, really profound. Right. Cause it's not like directly tied to game progress or, you know, skipping, skipping ahead of the queue and not putting in your hours and buying, you know, and buying instead of grinding. Um, no, just one no, more thing. I think, yeah, oh, go ahead. I would just say that, you know, the value for users of second life doesn't have anything to do with achievement or accomplishment. It purely has to do with how it makes them feel to present themselves there. And that feels still really positive in a lot of ways and, and really powerful. Yeah. I mean, this, this popped up when you were kind of going through that lineage of spaces. It's a bit of an aside, but just I, I, on a creature comfort level, what virtual spaces did you hang out in during the pod pod moment of the pandemic? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> so many different ones. I felt like yeah. I jumped around um, a lot. Um, I actually started playing... Um, a lot of things I, in terms of massively multiplayer, I started yeah. playing a game called Genshin Impact, which was kind of modeled after, it's an open world game that's modeled after Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, but is totally separate um, and kind of has an anime character aesthetic um, to it. Um, it has a lot of really rich narrative, um, but there's a lot of opportunity to invite other players into your instance of the world or to visit other players' instances of the world and do things together. Um, and I had a lot of fun, you know, killing bad guys with strangers um, yeah. during endemic era. It's a really beautiful open space for exploration. Um, more than that, I played... Um, a lot of a single player experience that also has similar like instance, um, you know, multi-user components. It was called Watch Dogs 2. It's a little bit of an older game, but it's set in a virtual San Francisco. This screenshot behind me is actually taken from a flower field in Watch Dogs 2 in their virtual rendering of San Francisco. And during the pandemic, I'm based in San Francisco. I couldn't like leave my house or go around the city. And so I somehow found a lot of relief in like driving my little car around this you know simulated version of the city it made me feel like i was you know getting out a little bit more than i actually was right. um so i really enjoyed that that's fun i love it um well here, here's an obvious angle and i want to kind of give new art city a shout out here because they're pretty on point um so um this is a, an online kind of virtual art platform that wade has done a bunch of curation in and Wade, I was just wondering if you could maybe talk about the platform a little bit and the types of projects you've staged in it. 
Absolutely. Um, I love sec I love New Art City. New Art City is an incredible um, artist toolkit. And basically what they've created is a toolkit for users to go online and create their own virtual environments. It's specifically oriented towards artists and um, artists to create installations in, in a virtual environment. Um, it's amazing. It loads right in browser. It runs off of uh, 3JS, um, which um, is uh, a 3D asset library kind of based in JavaScript. Um, and it's it's really powerful um, and can do a lot with not a lot of data. Um, and I you know, I was really lucky. I, I have a close relationship with the founders of New Art City. And from the very beginning, uh, you know, they wrote to me saying, hey, Wade, we're putting together this toolkit. Do you want to try it? And so I was actually one of the first people to experiment with the platform. Um, and so I got to kind of help them work out some of the kinks at the very beginning. Um, and I was totally obsessed with New Art City for a number of reasons. One, because unlike something like Mozilla Hubs or On Cyber or any of these other newer, you know, in-browser virtual experiences, you couldn't augment the 3JS code or whatever code that platform was running um, yourself. Whereas, uh, sec whereas in New Art City, because it's a, it's a you know, artists created toolkit oriented towards artists, they have a lot of opportunities for you to write custom code and kind of do things that are outside of what is currently possible there. Um, and so I had been working with a group called Most Dismal Swamp based uh, out of the UK. And I really wanted the work to be in a dismal swamp. I was like, let's go for the obvious. You know, I don't care if this is, you know, trite. Like this work is meant to be in a heaping mess of muck. So let's make a heaping mess of muck. And I really was excited by the opportunity to create exactly what I wanted. The exact, you know, I I think a lot in terms of thinking about artwork online, what is the native environment for this work? What is the ideal, best possible case scenario for viewing this work? If you could put this work in any kind of environment, where is it going to live its best life? Um, and for a lot of this work, it, you know, for the work that we were doing, it was in a uh, mucky bog. So um, it was really exciting to get to do something very simply, and I'm not a very technical person at all. Um, you know, they have a great, the toolkit has an amazing user interface. Um, I was able to, you know, create within that environment um, and kind of execute my vision in a way that uh, was really close to what I had in my head. Um, and that was an awesome experience. Um, and New York City is still online today. They're continuing to update and upgrade. Um, there are hundreds, if not thousands of exhibitions that are all artist and curator led. Um, and I highly recommend folks, you know, give it a browse, give it an yeah. explore exploration. Yeah. They currently Absolutely. have, um, they currently have a pavilion um, in this year's edition of the wrong Biennale. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, a real soft spot for that project too. And it just seems so aligned with your interests. So what a, what a nice, nice, nice. I mean, not at all surprised, but it's just great to see all the work you've done together. Um, well, here's a, a bit of a bigger question and maybe this can kind of be an open closer cause it's a, it's a bit speculative. Um, you know, people like to dunk on the metaverse still probably not unrelated to the fact that it was Zuckerberg that was pushing it so hard, but we've had lots of these visions of virtuality in many different shapes and forms you know, over the last several decades, actually. Second Life is one, you know, the, the old kind of 90s cyberpunky one. Um, but there's a kind of a, a few kind of contemporary competing models. So we have um, the Zuck, the Zuck vision, which seems like kind of like a, like a Facebookified Second Life. Like what, at least if I look at the, those, the, the early demos they pitched before they pivoted back towards AI and kind of, I know they're still working on Quest. Now we have Apple and spatial computing, which seems to be about productivity and overlaying the real world with information and maybe not as immersive in the same way. And then I would also put, and you talked about lots of these examples, the massive multiplayer online game space is like another alternative of like a kind of a virtual space. So some of these are augmented, some of these are virtual, and some of them are like, you know, the headset or screen, right? This is the kind of paradigms. Um, what do you kind of think about the interplay and maybe tensions between these different virtualities? And do you, I'm not asking, this isn't a horse race. I'm not asking you to pick a winner, but maybe what do you, how do you kind of see these like different approaches to thinking about virtuality kind of playing out over the next, you know, near future? Huge question, but I'm sure you must think about this all the time because you seem so immersed oh, in the, with the present and the past. Yeah. 
I think about this every day. Um, and I work with artists who think about this every day. Um, and there's a couple ways I could answer this question. So I might like go down a few different threads. Okay. Um, but one consideration here is the reality of hardware. Um, one thing about engaging in virtual worlds is having access to the kind of hardware that can run and operate these sorts of experiences. So to me, the things that are the most exciting are things that can load in any browser. New Art City is, for instance, is light enough that you can use it on a mobile phone, you can use it on a laptop, you can use it on a Chromebook, you can use it on a gaming PC, and you'll have a pretty similar experience no matter what. Um, even if you have somewhat low bandwidth, once the world reses up, um, they work pretty smoothly um, and don't require the most intensive graphics card. Um, a lot of video games today and a lot of artist creations in engines like Unreal require a really advanced video card. Um, yeah. You know, most computers can't run to the, you know, desired spec, um, most of these experiences and worlds. When you get into virtual reality and headset-based experiences, you need to own at a minimum of a $400 piece of equipment in order to access that at any time. And there really is no alternative um, at a lower price point. Um, and what I find, you know, working also with artists from the global South is that these technologies are not accessible. Um, if you have to pay more, you know, uh, you know, almost basically anything for any of these services, you're automatically excluding a vast majority of the population, um, both in terms of like technical access and financial access, you know, so physical access, so on and so forth. Um, the other thing that I, so I'm really excited about in-browser rendering. I'm really excited about the advancements that are happening in things like 3JS, in different, um, you know, code-based 3D libraries, um, the ways that users can, like, use things that are readily accessible to all of us to create really immersive experiences. Also, one of the reasons why I love Roblox, because even though it does require a download of the Roblox kind of player, um, it's super light. It's super light. Most computers can run it. Any mobile phone, you know, from 2015 or later can run it. Um, and that is so much more accessible than, you know, even something like Second Life, which probably a lot of people like wouldn't have downloaded or thought was too complicated for them, you know, at the time. Um, the other thing that I think about in relationship to this and kind of the future of this field that's related is the availability of critical mineral resources. Um, every computer, every graphics card, every microprocessor requires things like cobalt, which yeah. exists in very small supply on our planet. And eventually they will run out. Um, and as a lot of uh, different theorists and economists and, you know, political strategists are talking about right now, um, those critical mineral resources are going to become, you know, the world, one of the world's hottest commodities. Um, many global nations, Canada included, are reorienting their goals and strategies yeah. to focus very closely on critical mineral resources because our world runs on digital tech. And when we don't, aren't able to produce that, that digital tech at a pace that we're used to, things are going to change a lot. Um, and the kind of advancements that we're seeing today are going to scale back as people look for simpler and lighter and easier and less physical resource intensive ways to do computation. And so, again, this is where I see the future going. I see us heading more towards lighter, easier, more interoperable, lower bandwidth, um, lower processing power uh, powered experiences um, because these are the things that are accessible. These are things that can be accessed by people all over the world, not just in the West. Um, and ultimately, by making these things more accessible to more users, companies, corporations, you know, for-profit businesses that are producing these things will orient in that direction because more users equals more money. Um, and so that's, you know, that's my kind of semi-pessimistic take on all of this. But I do really think it's extremely positive that anyone working in virtual spaces or operating in, in this terrain think about this issue of access. Because, you know, if your file, if you're working with something that is, you know, over 15 to 20 megabytes, like 
if somebody isn't in a gig speed Wi-Fi, you know, network, it's going to be a miserable experience. They might not, it might not even load properly ever. Um, and, you know, that issue of exclusion of audience members based on their ability to, uh, you know, have access to high render technology, um, you know, poses a really big problem. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. That's where I, that's kind of where I see all this going. I mean, I already considered the the um, the Vision Pro a luxury object, but just when you stack the the kind of critical mineral thing on top of it, that part of on top of it, it really kind of underscores how. I mean, maybe perhaps by design, even you know, Apple being Apple, they can put out a device that I don't know would be several months income in many parts of the world, and it'll do just as fine as a luxury object. But I guess I guess it's not about access. Um, do you have, just outside of that, outside of the kind of like the political economy of minerals and, and access, like does ha, ha, what I'm just kind of curious, like, what are your thoughts on like, just as like a paradigm, the way that Apple is kind of pitching this spatial computing metaphor? Um, like, I mean, it interesting I, to you, would you work that way? Um, I personally don't i mean it's it's interesting it's certainly interesting i mean i think that the history of augmented experiences is really rich and really exciting i think about you know i think all the time about um manifest.ar's original ar manifesto and kind of what they thought that this technology could do for artists the ways that it could allow them to do the kind of you know guerrilla you know an activist work that you know we were just talking about in second life um and so, of course, it's interesting. It's fascinating. Um, but do I think that this is something that will change the paradigm in a dramatic way in the short term? Not at all. You know, again, we're talking about luxury objects. We're talking about um, able-bodied people only. Um, you know, if you're if you don't have an if you're not an able-bodied person or you have any certain there are so many different reasons why the vision pro couldn't work for you uh it's heavy it requires close physical contact on your face there are so many different reasons why someone would not be able to use it um and i also and i think that you know we're really our culture our society is just not really ready for the kind of mediation that is worn and bodied in that way, that separation from other human beings, you know, me, call me a, call me a hopeless romantic or something like yeah. this. But I do think that people, despite what they think, you know, is fun or flashy in a particular moment, people care about people and they care about being with people. And I don't think that has ever changed or will ever change. Um, and so I, I don't really see, a, a, you know, some of these dystopian visions of like a vision pro future where everybody's just kind of like walking around and bumping into each other with these huge, you know, space goggles on their head. Um, I don't really see that coming to pass. I see this as being really a really powerful tool potentially for folks who you know uh are neurodivergent for instance and could utilize a different kind of spatial thinking or computation um or you know workflow i could see that being a really profound change um but again like this is one of my issues in general with te with tech and with silicon valley um and this is something that also tom bellstorff the anthropologist who i referenced before in relation to second life advocates a lot for um is that when tech is developed it has to in consider disability and it has to consider accessibility at the ground floor right um and something like the vision pro absolutely does not do that so i'm really excited about the ways that we can take and repurpose tech for accessibility um but i'm also really interested in you know new development in totally flipping the script starting from scratch with the goal of creating accessibility you know right there at the beginning um because as we've seen most of these technologies are not built um you know for accessibility um but end up being repurposed that way just like second life was not created for folks with disability but ended up becoming this kind of place that you know coalesced the community that allowed them to do all of these things and as a result you know second life then made additional add-ons, made changes to the platform to continue to encourage folks, maybe to, you know, maybe folks who needed a screen reader, you know, ma making integrations for, you know, software like that so that, you know, all different kinds of, you know, folks could, could uh, participate. Um, 
I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, very, very thoroughly. You did go down a few threads. Well, I, I think we're good. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for your generosity. This has been really fascinating. I, I know a moderate amount about this stuff, and I, I learned a lot. I was taking notes pretty furiously all through your talk and more so even your uh, subsequent answers. So thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, sure. And Thanks yeah. so much. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And for uh, folks that are watching this, um, stay tuned for the May edition of Alt History uh, when we are joined by Toronto cultural worker Belinda Kwan. Um, so thanks again, Wade, and uh, see you all soon. <laughs>